And here's what I'd like you to think about. We do amazing things in chemical industry. It's amazing what we've done over the last 150, 160 years. But if you look at nature, nature outperforms us hands down in diversity and structure, but also does it at room temperature, at ambient pressure, using water as a solvent. Whereas we have to heat things up to high temperature, high pressure. Why? Why is it that humans have to do things in manufacturing at high temperature, high pressure. Well, if you think about it, a thermometer is a molecular speedometer. What we do is we, took we take molecules and put them in solvents and ask them to collide into each other. And because we need them to collide very often, because they have to have the right energy and the right trajectory, we must heat things up so that they collide more often. Think about it for a second. Never in nature does a collision occur. In nature, every synthetic transformation first has the two molecules assembled together through hydrogen bonding, pi stacking, or lipophilic interactions, and then once they're assembled together, they undergo a transition to another chemical reaction. All right, and I said, that seems interesting, that humans have an enthalpy, a delta H bias in how we design our, um, our processes, but nature has an entropy bias, in which first it reduces the degrees of freedom, then does it. So I started to look at manufacturing processes and say, how can I put in a switch so that I, in, I, I control the self-assembly? And I called this non-covalent derivatization. Now, I'm such a nerd. In Massachusetts, the license plate of my automobile is, in fact, NCD for non-covalent derivatization. So I really get into this, OK? And so now, you know, there are journals. I was on the inaugural editorial board of Crystal Engineering and Crystal Growth and Design. But essentially at Polwood, one of the things I did was I came up with this technology to control the diffusion of molecules in a thin film. And so Polaroid went to large-scale manufacturing with this technology. Now, to do that, you have to have EPA approval. The Environmental Protection Agency of the United States must give the thumbs up if you're going to go to large-scale manufacturing. And there's documentation you have to do called low-volume exemption and a pre-manufacturing notification. Now, this is before computers and the internet, so these are boxes full of files that we sent to Washington, D.C. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited. And ultimately, they rejected the application, not because of toxicity, not because of environmental impacts. They said, small molecules, are you crazy? Molecular complexes, are you high? They had no idea what I was talking about. So Polaroid put me on an airplane and sent me to Washington, D.C. to give a seminar to the EPA about non-covalent derivatization. So here I am, the first time in my life I was on an airplane. I'm holding a briefcase of overhead transparencies. I'm a little scared, but I'm also a little mad. And I'm standing at the door of the EPA, and I go in, and I meet the branch chief of the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics, this guy named Paul Anastas. Wait a minute, I recognize this guy. Remember the kid that I followed into the research lab when I was a music major? It was him. I've known this guy my whole life. In fact, I was playing in a jazz band with his older brother. There's him, there's me, there's my older brother with phenomenal hair. And, and, and actually, this guy here, if anyone's ever gone to Las Vegas, the guy who plays Rod Stewart in Las Vegas, the legends, is the guitar player there. So it's a very small world. But I know Paul, and I can say, wait a minute. Polaroid was manufacturing these processes through several steps using energy and hazardous reagents. We've replaced it with an aqueous, non-toxic. Why is the EPA giving me a hard time for something that they should be actually celebrating, shouldn't they? And that's when the next epiphany happened. So this is around 1990, 1991. The Pollution Prevention Act had just come out. People are talking about measuring, monitoring, remediating, recycling. And here I am, a synthetic organic chemist in industry who came up with something that kind of sidesteps all that by being benign in the first place. Isn't that kind of interesting? Shouldn't we be promoting the invention of technologies that avoid the hazard in the first place? But how does the science grow? How do scientists communicate and grow, and grow their, their thoughts? 
Well, there needs to be a framework. There needs to be a lexicon. There needs to be something. And in 1990, 1991, there was no language to describe how do you make something that's environmentally benign and non-toxic and therefore non-regulated and cost-effective in industry. It takes a whole sentence to say it. And that was the birth of green chemistry. So a guy in industry and a guy at the EPA said, we need to create a science so that there can be conferences, so that there can be journals, so that there can be textbooks, so that scientists can create an intellectual framework so that we can have an incremental approach of learning how to design processes and products that minimize the use in, 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 of, of hazardous materials. And so for me, and this is very important to me, the definition of green chemistry is to help society attain its sustain sustainability objectives. So what green chemistry is not is a journal article, is not a talk at a conference. It must be a successful product in the market. And so yes, it has to have some environmental benefit, but it also has to have superior performance. No one is going to buy a product that doesn't work just because it's green. And it has to have superior cost because society has demonstrated it will not pay a premium for something that's environmentally benign. So if it doesn't fit what is already accepted in an environment thing, so having superior performance and superior cost, then and only then do you have what I call green chemistry. And so it's not, and, and if it's not that, then it's not being practiced and it's not being used. And so, so that's the important aspect, is that it has to have super... Because in any economic model, if the only distinguishing feature is its sustainability aspect, not its performance and cost, it will not be successful in the marketplace and ultimately won't be. But think about it. If something has superior performance, superior cost, and oh, by the way, it's better for the environment, what barriers could there possibly be in the market? So perhaps the only barrier is the invention in the first place, if you accept this criteria. So anyways, we wrote this book, and I feel, feel, feel very strange that this book, anybody could have written this book. It was very common sense, very straightforward, and we wrote what was called the 12 Principles of Green Chemistry. And I feel like, you know the movie Forrest Gump? You know, I, I feel like I got turned into Forrest Gump. All of a sudden, I'm, I've been to 35 countries, meeting presidents and prime ministers, cutting ribbons, giving talks, to something that anybody could have written, and I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. But it's amazing what's happened. The word green chemistry, I did a sci-fi and a search literally just this weekend. And what you see is not a whole heck of a lot until around here. Then look. There's been an explosion, but what I'm most excited about is not the literature references, but the patents. And I think that that's the most important thing, that industry recognizes that this makes sense. Okay? And then Pike Research published this report a couple months ago, saying that in their estimation, green chemistry would be a $100 billion market by 2020. Okay. There is motivation. I suspect what we don't have is the ability to meet the motivation. All right, so I gotta, I gotta take a step back and, and add one more chapter to this story to understand where I personally am coming from. So I started green chemistry with Paul Anastas at this intellectual level saying, okay, this is better for companies, it's better for this, it's better for that. Never really thinking about it from a more emotional, what we'd call the tree-hugging experience, okay? It was really just a practical, pragmatic thing. And at about this point in my life, um, my career was going really well at Polaroid. Things were happening. I'd come out with this book, things on you know, green chemistry. When disaster hit, I lost my son to a birth defect called biliary atresia in which his liver was completely detached from his intestines. He was given a surgery on the first week that he was born, and it kept him alive for a couple of years, but ultimately I lost him. And the reason I give this talk is and I brag about, look at all my patents, look at all my papers, look at how I was on Celebrity Magazine. And, and so I'm, I'm bragging about all these things. Imagine how I felt the evening of my son's funeral lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, asking myself, what if something I touched caused my son's disease? 
What if something I interacted with ultimately caused this birth defect? I didn't feel, how could I be such a successful chemist and not know the answer to that question? I'm, a, I'm, I'm aware of these books like Our Stolen Future that are talking about impacts of health, of, of chemicals. At this point, I'd probably synthesized over 2,500 new molecules in my career. And I asked myself, I never had a class in toxicology. I never had a class in environmental mechanisms. How could I be such a successful chemist and have no idea what makes a chemical toxic? Yes, I've had classes on how to label waste and how to wear gloves and wear masks when appropriate, but what mo molecular features make, it was absent from my education. Now that I was interested, okay, chemists have higher incidence of certain types of tumors, elevated breast cancer mortality among, report after report, how could I have four years of undergraduate and four years of graduate school, I never had a seminar, I never had a semester, I never had a class, anything about this. So then when I got interested, I started looking. In 2000, and every five years we keep these in, so I'm not, I don't have the 2013 numbers yet, but in 2008, in the United States alone, we graduated 17, 1,800 undergraduates in chemistry, 3,000 masters, 3,000 PhDs. In 2004, for the first time in history, more women became chemists than men. What could be more important to the field of chemistry than some understanding of the impacts of human health and the environment from a molecular structure perspective? And yet, to get a degree in chemistry, at least in the United States and mostly worldwide, not one university on the planet requires a student to demonstrate any knowledge of, in, of, of how to predict. Now think about that for a second. Doctors, lawyers, teachers, nurses, architects, engineers, all, when they graduate, they can't practice their trade. They must get a license and maintain that license throughout their career. There's no such thing in chemistry. Now, I don't, I'm not proposing that there should be, but we talk about looking at industry, saying this is an epic battle of good and evil. Why is industry doing this? This isn't an industrial issue. This is an academic issue. Why aren't we training our students to understand this? So all the desire in the world, if the basic fundamental um, skills aren't being presented, how can we do it? So when we talk about sustainable and green, we've got to ask ourselves, are we training future chemists to meet the needs that we're asking for? And so after 11 years of Polaroid, I decided to go to academia and try to change it. And so I went to the UMass system and I did the assistant, associate, full professor, chair of chemistry, director of biochemistry, professor of plastics engineering, and I created a PhD program in green chemistry. I had everything that is in a normal chemistry program, but added a one semester course in mechanistic toxicology added a one semester course in environmental mechanisms, added a one semester course in law and policy. Now, it took nothing out. First and foremost, chemists have to be excellent problem solvers in the lab. But adding that extra thing, next thing you know, I had about 120 students over 10 years past. The average time it took one of these students to get a job in industry, two days. The longest anyone ever looked for a job was two weeks because she turned down her first couple of job offers. I've been out of academia for almost 10 years. I'm still getting phone calls from companies. Do you got any graduate students? Because they know how to solve the problems but also have a clue about those real, real world implications. Of all the products and processes, here is the way my, I assess things. If you look at all the products and processes that we have in commerce today, about 10% escape some scrutiny. 90% of them, somebody somewhere, is shaking their fist, either rightly so or wrongly so, but we live in a world where perception dominates science. But we have the situation where 90% of our products have a problem under the sustainability umbrella. There is this process that is called alternatives assessment, where we ask people to look in the supply chain for an alternative. I believe that such a process can only be successful 25% of the time. That today in 2013, over 65% of the technologies haven't been invented yet. Now we can look at this in despair and say, oh my God, or we could say, what better time in history to be a chemist? 
What could be more important to the future of humanity than this? When a child who's in the, is a 15 years old, big eyes, wants to save the world, what are they gonna think of as the degrees that they should get the programs? It's not chemistry, and it should be. We need to be saying to the future students, you want to be part of a sustainable future, be the person who invents the technology to transition this to that.